Hi and welcome to this new video on computational finance. My name is Gregor Weiss. I'm a professor of finance here at Leipzig University. Neuer Versuch. Hi and welcome to this new video on computational finance. My name is Gregor Weiss. I'm a professor of sustainable banking here at Leipzig University. And in this lecture series, I want to show you the details and models of computational finance, how it is nowadays used in both academia and industry. In this video, I want to start with the portfolio theory by Markowitz, which is actually a quite um, classical theme in finance lectures, also lectures on portfolio management, but we need those models later on when we apply computational and numerical analysis uh, models to the setting of managing and optimizing a portfolio. So for everyone to be on the same page, we have a look at the traditional classical model by Markowitz. If you want to read about this, there are numerous textbooks on um, portfolio management and portfolio theory. Also, of course, the original works by Markowitz back from the 60s and 50s. Um, if you are fluent in German, for example, you can have a look at this book by Albrecht and Maurer, Investment und Risikomanagement. But as I mentioned, there are just um, numerous textbooks out there that you can use to get the details of portfolio theory. So we start by setting up our base model for the investigation of portfolios in terms of the theory by Markowitz. The basic idea is that it should be, by intuition, a bad idea to put all your eggs in one basket, meaning you shouldn't invest in just one stock. If you pick Tesla, if you pick Nvidia, if you um, be more conservative maybe and pick a Microsoft stock, anything that could happen to one of these companies could hurt you as a shareholder, as an investor, because you are not diversified. So diversification, meaning putting your money in more and more investments and to spread your investments, to diversify, this intuitively seems like a good idea. But of course, we need to show how this works theoretically. And this is just uh, just not an intuitively uh, good way of um, investing. But also theoretically, this is um, a way of investing that comes with a benefit. We have N financial securities. These could be stocks, these could be bonds, anything else. Just um, we talk of financial securities. And these are characterized by their returns over a period as we define them below. The return is just uh, the price, the quote, plus the dividend minus the previous quote or price divided by the previous quote. Quote. So we have an appreciation in price and we might also have a dividend payout. And all of this gives us a positive or negative return. Um, in the further analysis, we just neglect the inclusion of, inclusion of dividends because it just, just makes things a little bit more comp, um, complex and complicated. And we don't really need this um, later on. The price at T0 is known. Of course, the next price is not known. Um, so this will at some point be a stochastic model, but uh, we can also look at historical returns. Now, the investors in our base model assess the profitability of investments based on two metrics. We concentrate on returns, more precisely expected return. It's stochastic, so we have an expectation and the volatility of returns. And why is that? Well, we need a metric, we need um, a measurement of what we want as an investor. That is expected return. We want higher returns. And something we need uh, to accept in order to get a higher return, and that is basically risk. How can we measure risk? Well, one way of doing this, and the way Markowitz did um, it, in his theory, was to use volatility, the standard deviation of volatility of returns. So in the end, the investors have a choice. Do you want higher returns, higher expected returns? If yes, you will probably have to accept a higher volatility. So higher return means higher risk and vice versa. And the tradable securities on our market can be divided as needed. 
this is obviously a deviation from uh, reality. Uh, usually you cannot buy two thirds of one stock, but here we just assume that we can invest 30% uh, of our money in one uh, security and trading these securities causes no transaction costs. So uh, we have a frictionless financial market. Um, we don't have taxes, we don't have transaction costs, we can um, trade as much as we want. You can include, of course, these frictions into the model, but in our base model, it makes sense to keep things simple. Starting point then is the idea that the risk of a portfolio of securities must always be less than or equal to the sum of all individual risks. Now, if you were to put 50% in Microsoft and 50% in Tesla stock, um, there should be an upper bound, a limit to the overall risk you are taking. And mathematically speaking, that should be the sum of the individual risks. But if you now combine these two investments in a portfolio, Ideally, you want to see a risk reduction due to the fact that for some reason, if Tesla goes up, Microsoft goes down maybe and vice versa. So there's diversification and there is an offsetting effect between the two stocks or N stocks. So if the variance of the return rate is used to measure the risk, we know that the variance of a linear portfolio, of a linear combination of returns or securities will be determined by the correlations between those two or N securities. And according to portfolio theory, we are not primarily invest, interested in a naive diversification. Naive diversification means we put one nth of our money in each and every one of the N stocks. So if you have 10 stocks, 10% stock A, 10% stock B, 10% stock C, and so on. That would be naive diversification. Naive in the sense that we don't think too much about why there could be diversification and where diversification could work best between, for example, Tesla and Microsoft or Tesla and Nvidia, but we just put one over N of our whole money and our investment uh, budget into each and every one of our stocks. So we are looking for a, at a targeted diversification, not a naive diversification. And in order to achieve this, we need to exploit the correlation structure between the securities. Markowitz diversification implies that a useful combination of these single investments can lead to a reduction in the overall risk of our portfolio, and that is a reduction in the variance of the return on that portfolio. And later we will see that especially uncorrelated or ideally even negatively correlated investments lead to such a diversification of risk. And as we are going to find out, a complete reduction, usually that is comparable to a perfect hedge, is not possible unless you add derivatives. But at first we consider the case of two securities, which we represent graphically below. So this would be perfect positive correlation, a correlation of plus one between investments A and B, meaning that if A goes up by one euro or dollar, B also goes up by one dollar or one percent. So positive perfect correlation and you can see the portfolio is just in between those two investments. If we have perfect negative correlation, if A goes our in this case C goes up by one dollar, D goes down by one dollar a percent. So we have um, a portfolio in which each change of one is cancelled out by the other. And we have maybe a trend here, but that's it. And anything in between where we have a not perfect negative or positive correlation can look like this and we can smooth out the ups and downs of the returns in our portfolio. Okay, for an analytical discussion of Markowitz portfolio theory. We just look at the returns R1 and R2. We start with the two um, security case. The share of security one in the portfolio is given by X. It is between zero and one. If it were a negative weight, this would mean that we allow for short selling. If it would be larger than one, you would allow lending and borrowing. And we're not doing this, not yet. So share of stock one is given by X and one minus X then is the share in stock two. The expected value and variance are given by mu i 
mu1, mu2, sigma1 squared, sigma2 squared, and we have a portfolio expected return mu pf and sigma squared pf for the variance on the return of the portfolio. And the correlation, as this is just the two security case, is one correlation factor and it's rho. The value and thus also return of the portfolio is linearly dependent on the individual values of the portfolio components. So more precisely, the return on the portfolio is given by x times r1 plus 1 minus x times r2, quite simply. Because the expected value is also a linear operator, we can just simply calculate the expected portfolio return by x times mu1 plus 1 minus x times mu2. So the linear, same linear combination of the expected values on R1 and R2. For the variance, it's a little bit more complicated, but we do have a very general formula from Statistics 101, that is for a linear combination of one, uh, sorry, two or n random variables, the variance of that linear combination, in our case the portfolio, is given by A1, the first weight, squared times sigma2, uh, sigma squared, plus a2 squared sigma uh, squared of um, the second random variable, plus a1, a2, rho, and then the standard variances, or 2, um, a1, a2 times the covariance. You can write it with rho, um, rho and the standard deviations, or using the covariance. Thus, in the last line, we have the variance on the portfolio return given by the weight x squared times sigma 1 squared plus 1 minus x squared times sigma 2 squared plus 2x 1 minus x rho sigma 1 sigma 2 and you could also substitute the last part using the covariance. Now in the next video we'll talk about the set of possible portfolios, the set of possible risk return profiles. So we'll be talking about what can we actually achieve if we are given two securities and we combine them linearly. Is, for example, any risk return um, combination possible? Obviously not, because then we would just choose 20% expected return and no risk. So there has to be a limited set of portfolios that um, is given by this combination of two stocks and we'll characterize those portfolios and then talk about which portfolios are optimal, which are efficient and which is um, which are the portfolios we should choose and how can we choose them. But that's um, the topic for the next video. I hope you enjoyed this one and see you next time.